Bay West Church meets at 100 Emerson Road in Palm Bay at 11 a.m. on Sundays. We're glad you decided to check us out. God has a specific message of hope for your life and mine today. So listen up. Well, good morning, church. Everyone alive and well today? Doing good. Uh, Pastor Jim asked me a few weeks ago to preach, and when he did, I knew immediately what I was going to preach. We do this in life group. We're going to be in John 13. And that's where we're at in our life group, and God has really been dealing with me through this passage as we think about broken connection. You know, uh, isn't it great to have someone that you're just connected with and on track, in harmony and smooth? That's a real blessing in life. Uh, Kathy and I yesterday was our anniversary. We've been married for 50 years yesterday. <clears throat> so I was just thinking, uh, maybe she should be up here <laughs> telling us how to keep a connection because, you know, it takes two people, and she does a great job with it, and we are very, very blessed. But now, on the other side of good connections, do you have any bad connections? Woo! <laughs> you know, most of us do. If, if you do not have any real bad connections, uh, you know someone who does. I mean, you know, they're all around us. We encounter it. We experience it. But really, Christ came. That's why Christ came to deal with those connections. Now, first, Christ came that we would be connected to Him. Above everything else, that's first, that's foremost. Now, if you're connected to Him properly then you will know how to respond to all your other connections, even when they go bad. We're going to talk this morning about what to do, what you and I need to do when a connection uh, goes amiss, when it's no longer correct. Because Christ, He came to heal and to restore us to Himself and to other people. So as we think this morning, I want us to to first look at the idea of, the, of, of Jesus' divine origination. Now, where did Jesus come from? He came from heaven. He is fully man and fully God. You say, well, what can I compare that to? Nothing else. <laughs> He's the only one that's fully God and fully man. I, I tell people in our life group, I said, what happened at the conception of Jesus in Mary's womb, that God and flesh connected. And Christ became a man. And he came on our behalf to help us in this life. Now, as we think of this, I want us to look at uh, John 13, beginning at verse 1, when we think about the origin of Jesus. Now, this is the evening before Jesus is going to the cross. He's going to the cross the next day, but his focus is on the disciples and preparing them for what they are going to experience in life. He wants, he wants them to understand something of forgiveness. He wants them to understand the importance of following his example in this matter. So here in John chapter 13, beginning at verse 1, Now before the feast of the Passover, Jesus, knowing that his hour had come, that he should depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And during supper, the devil, having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, the, the son of Simon, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come forth from God and was going back to God. Jesus he always existed. He came from God. He was going back. He told the religious leaders one day, he said, I was, in essence, before Abraham. And they didn't understand. That upset them for him to make that claim. But he was. Now, Jesus, coming from God, is really the creator of all things. Everything you see and everything you do not see in the universe was created by Jesus. Now, John begins his gospel by clarifying this in John chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. In the beginning was the Word. Now, the Word is Jesus. That's a word for Him, and we'll see that in a moment more clearly. But He communicates God to us. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. 
He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being by him and apart from him. Nothing came into being that has come into being. And then we go down to verse 14 of the same chapter. And the word became flesh. So the word created everything, yet the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Now, sometimes we think of creation and we lose sight of the wonder of creation. But in modern day science, we can see more into it. As we think about the vastness of creation, when we think about the person of Jesus, I want us to have in mind exactly what we mean when we say creation, to some degree, uh, understand. Now, first, if we look at a slide here of the earth and Venus, uh, notice the, the size here. The earth looks pretty large. I mean, we're spinning around. Uh, we're pretty big compared to Venus, Mars, Mercury, Pluto, and these other planets. But now let's look at the next slide. Uh, the earth becomes relatively small when compared to Jupiter and Saturn, even Uranus and Neptune, and these other planets. But let's look at the third slide here with the sun. Now, I mean, are you getting an idea of the vastness of creation? Jesus, who walked on this earth, spoke all of this into being. He created it all. So look how small we are. Now, on the next slide, we see some other stars, <laughs> Arcturus and uh, Pollux. Now, these are dwarfed even by our <clears throat> in size there. And uh, the, uh, the next slide has uh, Betelgeuse and, and Taurus. Now, these, you see how vast this creation is. I mean, you can't show the earth here in, in proportion because it wouldn't show up. There's a vastness of creation <clears throat> that's all around us. And the scripture tells us that Jesus created all these things. Now, if we come back to John chapter 1, verse 10, he was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. Hmm. They had trouble. Uh, we talk about this in our life group. If, if you're not in a life group, I encourage you to be in a life group somewhere. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, we talk about this, that uh, Jesus, he just looked so much like a man that people couldn't believe he was God. And he was, he was accused of making himself out to be God because he was fully God, fully man. He just looked like any other human being uh, you know, to us, yet that's who he was. Now, when we think about the wonder of Jesus coming to the earth, you know, we think about his power, his glory, his majesty. I want us to think something about his humility today. The humility of Christ it is indisputable as we look at it. Look at verse 4 of the passage. Now this is the Creator with His disciples. And Jesus rose from supper and laid aside His garments. And taking a towel, He girded Himself about. Then He poured water in the, the basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which He was girded. So the Creator of the world Is on his knees washing the feet of disciples. Now, I don't know about you, but that's more humility than I can comprehend in my human mind. It is astounding when we think about it. Here's a picture that might help illustrate the creator of the world appearing to be any other man except for his miracles and the life that he lived, is washing the disciples' feet. That is humility beyond recognition. <clears throat> now, they had public baths. They would go to a public bath in these areas often. And when you came home, you would have to wash your own feet because the streets were dirty and dusty. Or you had a slave to wash your feet. Jesus is taking the role of a slave here in washing the disciples' feet. The scripture says that he, in, in, in John 13 there, that he laid aside his garments. In, in essence, he laid aside the outward manifestation of his glory. He took a towel and girded himself, wrapped it around himself. That speaks of him being a servant. 
And then at the end, it says he took his garments back on again. He went back to God. And he, he today, the outward manifestation of his glory in heaven is there. So this is something of the person of Christ. But let's follow the passage through in verse 6. So Jesus came to Simon Peter and said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? In other words, Peter had a hard time seeing Jesus as a slave before him. Jesus answered and said to him, What I do you do not realize now, but you shall understand hereafter. Peter said to him, Never shall you wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Now, no part with me means, Peter, you're not going to be in fellowship with me. Uh, you're not going to be participating in what God is doing in this world, in his kingdom, if I do not wash you. So uh, Peter quickly responds and said to Jesus, Lord, in verse 9, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. So Peter is understanding the importance of what Jesus is doing when Jesus made that particular remark there. Now, the water is symbolizing... See, we often think of Jesus washing feet as an end in itself. But it's going to become clear as we see it what Jesus is communicating that He is the only one in this world that can make you clean before God. No one else. You cannot make yourself clean before God. The proverb says, Who can say I've cleansed my heart? I'm pure from my sins. Only Jesus... If Jesus does not wash us, we are not in right relationship with Him. But understand the humility here. He will wash us if we yield to Him, as Peter's doing here. But Peter just, he kind of just saw the foot washing and didn't understand that Jesus was doing this symbolic of the cleansing of the heart and the cleansing of sin from our hearts and from our lives. So in verse 5 of the passage here, then he poured water, Jesus into the basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Now, the, the water here is symbolic of the Word of God and the blood of Christ, which cleanses us. Uh, later, in John 15, Jesus will say, Now you are clean through the Word which I have spoken to you. And it is as the Word of God is applied to our lives that we become clean before Him. And then verse 10, as Jesus says, He who has bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean, and you are clean, but not all of you. Now, so Jesus is communicating that, Peter, you're a believer in God. You are cleansed from your sin. You're going to heaven. And, and because once we believe in God, we are in essence judicially forever cleansed from our sin. There's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus never condemns us because we are His child through faith in Him. Now, as His child, does that mean we can sin? Absolutely. <laughs> does that mean we will sin? Yes, we will. I mean, it's just the, the nature, the human nature is to sin. So we, we all have this sin. So what Jesus is, is demonstrating through this is, Peter, you're a believer in God. But you have to have sin cleansed from your life as a child of God on an ongoing basis. It's just a part of being a believer. It's a part of living the Christian life. So Peter is being cleansed here in this essence. It's kind of like a few weeks ago, Kathy, my wife, said, uh, would you uh, shampoo the carpet? I don't know about you guys, but I'd much rather, much rather mow the yard than shampoo the carpet. I mean, I would rather mow the yard and use my chainsaw to wash dishes. It's just the way it is. But, but she said, okay, so I did. And then a few days later, we got a little Pomeranian dog. He came through the house and had an accident on the carpet. Now, I didn't re-clean the whole carpet. I just did, we just did the spot, okay? So this is what Jesus is demonstrating here, to have this sin that enters our life cleansed. I mean, Peter's going to deny Christ three times this same evening. So we need to be clean. We all have sin in our life that we need to be cleansed from. Now, verse 11, For he knew, Jesus knew the one who was betraying him for this reason. He said, Not all of you are clean. Now, he's speaking of Judas here. He's washing their feet. But he's telling us there's one here that's not clean. 
Now, now think about Judas. I mean, this guy lived with Jesus and the disciples for three years. He preached. He was a treasurer. And he was never truly a believer. Hmm. You know, a lot of people hang around Jesus or church, so to speak, but have never really become believers in Christ. There's a difference. Uh, Judas, I mean, even later when Jesus, uh, Jesus talks more about someone betraying him, the disciples are like, who is he talking? Even the disciples had no idea that Judas was not a true believer. Sometimes it's not easy to tell uh, in life, and we have to make sure that our hearts are there, we are, we are right before God. Verse 7 of our passage, what I do now, uh, what I do, you do not realize now, but you shall understand hereafter. Again, they just saw it as a foot washing ceremony uh, for a practical purpose, but they did not realize the, the cleansing that Jesus was applying to their life. Now, Judas is one there who was about to betray Christ. He, he is about to sell him out for crucifixion. In verse 18, uh, Jesus said, He who eats my bread has lifted up his heel against me. Now get the picture. The creator of this vast universe in this world is washing feet. I mean, I can just only imagine, but coming to the feet of Judas, who has lifted up his heel against Jesus, and he's down on his knees, washing the feet of the one who was about to betray him. Now, that is humility that's beyond comprehension. But yet, that's what Jesus did. Setting an example for us in regard to forgiving others and being Christ-like in our lives. Now, Scripture is very clear Sometimes we struggle with unforgiveness. I struggle with it sometimes. Uh, we all do. But do you know that the Bible teaches that we're to forgive everyone of everything at all times? And that's an example that's being presented to us here uh, in the life of Jesus. Um, sometimes, you see, Jesus, this is an aspect, it's hard to explain, really, it's hard to grasp, but Jesus never in his early life, had unforgiveness toward anyone. If he did have, Judas would have been a prime one. I'm not washing your feet. I know what you're about to do. No. He humbled himself and washed his feet. It is an amazing thing uh, to comprehend that. So we have a responsibility as believers in Christ because we're following him to forgive everyone of everything. <laughs> I say, well, that, that, that's not too easy. I, I can't do that. I understand that perspective, but let's follow it through here. Well, Jesus said in Matthew 6, verse 14 and 15, For if you forgive men for their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men, then your Father will not forgive you your transgression. Now, the point here is, as a child of God, if you want to be in fellowship with God, you must forgive everyone of everything. Because if you do not, then God as your Father is not forgiving you. You're not having a part in what He's doing in the world and in the kingdom. And, and so, well, how come, how come we have so much unforgiveness amongst believers? Because one thing, we do not treasure the fellowship that we have with Christ. When we treasure that, Above everything else, we will learn the significance and the importance of forgiving everyone of anything that's committed against us. This is, this is maintaining a right connection with other uh, people. Now, uh, Peter had trouble understanding these, these things, as, as Peter often did. As we look at a different passage in Matthew 18, verse 21, uh, Peter asked the question, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him up to seven times? Now, some say that the rabbis of that day taught, if someone sinned against you one time, forgive them. If they sin a second time against you, forgive them. If they sin a third time against you, forgive them. If they sin a fourth time against you, let them have it. <laughs> okay? You don't have to forgive them anymore. That's it. 
You've drawn the line. And we don't know, but Peter may have been having trouble forgiving others for what was going on. We don't, we're not told. But, but he asked the question, how many times should I forgive? Uh, you know, someone who, who sins against me up to seven times. He really put it up there. But Jesus responded with this in verse 22. I do not say uh, to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. Woohoo! Now that's 490 times. And, and the point here, seven is a number of perfection. So what Jesus is saying is you have to always forgive everyone of anything. It's your Christian responsibility. It is my Christian responsibility. Uh, that's how we maintain connection with God because if, if we do not forgive others, He do not, does not forgive us in the parental sense as His children. So we must. Now, we're going to walk through some aspects of this and maybe see how we can better do this. Uh, we were, uh, I guess this really brought home to me on June 17th, about two weeks ago. I was, Kathy and I were out at the flea market, Renninger's Flea Market. We like to knock around up there. Boy, that's a, but they got more stuff up there than any place I've ever seen in my life. But we were up there, and we go separate ways. She likes to look at certain things, and I like to look at certain things. And we were up there, and uh, of course, sometimes I like to engage people about a relationship with Christ. And I was walking down one of those long wild uh, aisle things, and there was a man there, had a table, he and his wife, and he was sitting there, and he was just kind of going on about some stuff. So I began to talk to him about, uh, about God and having a relationship with God. Well, I found out he was a Christian. He really was a Christian. And he shared with me about reading the Bible and being fellowship with God. He said that he was saved when he was eight years old. I mean, you know, that's pretty young. But he said when he went home, he was just kind of walking on the air. He said, I knew that I had come into a relationship with God. And so he gave quite a testimony. He said, now, you know, I've not always lived a Christian life. I've kind of been in. I've kind of been out. Now, this is an older man. And, uh, but he said, I've, I've always, you know, uh, known I'm a, I'm a Christian. I know I'm in a relationship with God. And so he was telling different things about his life and different things. He had got on alcohol was with uh, Alcohol Anonymous and different things. But he came to a point after we talked for a while, and I was about ready to leave, and he said, uh, can I tell you a story about my life? I said, sure. He said uh, a few years back that he received a phone call that someone had brutally murdered his 42-year-old daughter. It was her boyfriend, if I remember correctly. I mean, she was brutally murdered. Now, this man was arrested and taken to jail for what he did, rightly so. Now, so the guy's name is Ernie. He said, he said I don't, you can tell my story if you want to, so if you see Ernie out there. <laughs> but uh, he, said, um, he said, what happened after that happened? He said, I became so angry. I became so mad. He said, Satan got a hold of my heart. He said, I went down to the police station across the street. I had a 357 pistol in my pocket, and I sat out there. He said, I was trying to contemplate how to get inside that jail with this pistol and how to kill that man. He said, now, to me, it did not matter what they did to me. If I get killed in the process, it doesn't matter. This man brutally murdered my daughter. He said, if they put me in jail for the rest of my life, that's no problem. This man brutally murdered my daughter. And uh, so he really was struggling, you know, as to what to do and how to respond. So he decided, he went back home, he couldn't figure out how to get into jail to kill the guy, or the guy that probably been dead today. And, but uh, he went back home and he called his prayer partners with uh, Alcohol Anonymous and said, you know, guys, pray for me. I, you know, this has happened, and it's a tragedy. So they prayed and got back to him, and they called him a few days later and said, okay, Ernie, this is what God told us. Forgive the man. <laughs> he said, oh, no. I want to kill the man. I don't want to forgive him. So, uh, so Ernie tells the story. He says, you know, 
okay, I'm going to pray and ask God because God has to grant us the ability to forgive someone. We can't do that on our own. I mean, if we're in a relationship with God, we have to have his empowerment to do that. That's part of being in fellowship with him. So Ernie, he goes, he goes home and he said, I even got on my knees all on and off for five days. I prayed and I prayed and I prayed. And he said, nothing happened. I still want to kill the guy. And he makes it quite a long story, but for 10 days he prayed, prayed and prayed. Nothing happened for 20 days. Nothing happened for 25 days. Nothing happened on his knees, on and off, praying, asking God, God, please, please, God, give me the grace to forgive this man for what he's done to my daughter. And Ernie said, on the 28th day, the forgiveness of God fell from heaven on his heart. He said, I had God's peace over what had happened. You see, just because we forgive someone doesn't mean that God's not going to take action against them for what they've done. We're not letting them off the hook, okay? So, but Ernie, and I could still see the peace of God in this man's life as he talked about this. I was amazed, you know, by his story that he had truly forgiven this man for what he had done, you know, to his daughters. Now, most of our sins that we talk about are really trivial matters, you know, in our relationship with God. But it does, it does violate any unforgiveness, whether it's something major like a murder of a loved one or something trivial. It violates our relationship, our fellowship with God and what he wants to do in us and through us. So we need this forgiveness. Now, let me look at one other passage here in Mark 11, verse 25, uh, just to clarify this maybe even more. Jesus said, And whenever you stand praying, forgive. If you have anything against anyone, so that your Father also who is in heaven may forgive you your transgressions. So we, we need this matter of forgiveness. Now, let me, again, let me say that forgiveness comes from God. It is a very special blessing just to say, okay, I completely forgive this person. Even though what they did was very hurtful, very harmful to me or to a loved one. Now, sometimes we enter into what we might call uh, a conditional uh, forgiveness. It kind of goes like this. Uh, I'll forgive you if you make things right. Hmm. I'll forgive you if you own up to your part of the problem. And one writer says we're kind of like a tiger swishing its tail. You make your move and I'll determine whether I'll come back and uh, forgive or whether I'll pounce and bite. <laughs> okay. So we run into that. Now, so, so there is what we call conditional forgiveness, which is not true forgiveness. Then another kind of forgiveness is partial forgiveness. You know, I, I forgive you, but I'm not going to forget what you did to me. Uh, I'll forgive but, uh, but if this happens again, I won't. So there's what we might call, this is not forgiveness, but we sometimes interpret it as such. Then a third kind is a substitute or delayed forgiveness, which says, you know, I'll forgive you someday, but I just can't right now. And most of us have been in some of these situations to some degree or another. And what we're doing, we're sitting on the judgment seat instead of the mercy seat. <laughs> It's a wonderful, freeing privilege to know that I can have mercy toward anyone, regardless of what they do or say to me. That is freeing to me as a believer in Christ. I enjoy that, and I, I, I try to appreciate that, because what happens with a broken connection here, resentment can come in, uh, hatred, grudges, bitterness. And, and so unforgiveness is, is kind of like the expression of, I'm drinking the poison, and I'm expecting you to get sick. I'm drinking the poison, and I'm expecting you to die. We're really harming ourselves through any means of unforgiveness toward anyone. We're harming ourselves. We're damaging our relationship with God. Jesus could say, I have no part with you in what you're doing in relationship to this. So first off, we should learn never to be offended. Uh, and we'll talk about how, try to how to do this a little bit. I, I know some of you are saying, no, wait a minute. <laughs> no, I'm going to be offended. No, no, try to learn never to. See, Proverbs says it's the glory of a person to overlook a transgression. And it is. But, uh, uh, you know, there's just different things that come into our lives in relationship uh, to this. Now, um, for some, forgiveness may take a few seconds. For some, it may take years like Ernie. Uh, if, if, if offended, 
were to forgive immediately. Now, one thing that's helped me with this over the years is in my prayer time in the morning, I, often I've done this over the years. I've said, okay, God, regardless of what anyone says to me today, or regardless of what anyone does, I purpose now in my relationship with you to forgive them. How does that help? Well, if I go through the day and someone offends me, I don't get caught up in unforgiveness. I've already decided what I'm going to do that makes it easier. I forgive you. My relationship with God is that important to me. So, you know, have that ongoing basis in our lives. Now, uh, we're not minimizing someone's sin when we forgive them. We're, we're, see, sometimes when we don't forgive, we're saying, God, you stay over here. <laughs> I'll deal with this. No, no. When we forgive, we're allowing God to enter into the equation and work in His time and in His will. So, uh, and it does not mean that we're to allow ourselves to be mistreated. You know, that's, that's not necessarily what we're talking about. But we're asking God to work in our behalf. Now, again, forgiveness does not let that person off the hook. Just because, we, because Ernie forgave that man did not mean that God forgave that man. That man has to come to God himself and repent to have God's forgiveness. So God is the one who handles this matter. Now, what we often don't understand, I think, is how, how Satan controls in the area of unforgiveness. He can control your life as a believer. It's like a story, a little story about a little boy named Johnny and Sally. They went to their grandparents' farm. And they were there, and Johnny had a slingshot and out in the woods, and he couldn't hit anything. He couldn't hit a thing. He kept shooting it and slinging a rock. And he got back toward the farm, and grandmother's duck was over there. He said, let me try one more time. And he hit the duck in the head and killed it. <laughs> okay. Well... He didn't know, but his little sister Sally was standing over there and saw it. He took the duck and hid it in the woodpile, but she didn't say anything. Well, later that night after uh, dinner, uh, uh, grandmother said, Sally, I, I want you to come help me wash the dishes. And Sally said, uh, uh, but grandmother, Johnny loved to wash dishes. And then she whispered to Johnny, remember the duck? So Johnny washed the dishes. Well, the next day, grand grandfather came and said, well, let's go fishing today. Come on. And, uh, uh, and, and grandmother said, no, I need someone to help me with the house today, clean and do things. And uh, Sally said, well, Johnny would love to do that. Remember the duck? So Johnny, well, that went on for several days. Johnny, after a while, Johnny got tired of being controlled by his sister. So he went to his grandmother and said, grandmother, this is what happened. I, would you, you know, I, I'm sorry, but I killed your duck. And grandmother said, I was standing at the window and I saw the whole thing. <laughs> I forgave you. I was just wondering how long you would let Johnny control you over that. And I'm asking you, how long do we let Satan control us in the matter of unforgiveness? <clears throat> he will control your church life if you don't forgive. He'll control your family life positively, negatively. He'll control, he'll control your friends He'll control where you work. But when you have a forgiving spirit, you rise above the offenses of this world. And you are empowered in a relationship with God. So finally, let's look here at Jesus' exemplary example as his followers. Verse 12. And when he had washed their feet and taken off his garments and reclined at the table, he said to them, Do you know what I've done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, the, te the Lord and the teacher, washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. So Jesus, in essence, is saying, forgive everyone of everything. I'm forgiving Judas, okay? I mean, of what he did to me. And so we're to follow that example. In verse 15, for I gave you an example that you should do as I did to you. Verse 16, truly, truly, I say to you, a slave is not greater than his master. So when we say, I'm not going to forgive, we're saying, I'm greater than Jesus. Mm. And that's not a good thing to say. That's not a good, good attitude to have toward other people. And then verse 17, if you know these things, you are blessed uh, if you do them. So knowing the importance of forgiveness 
and doing it is two different things. It's one thing to know I'm supposed to forgive. It's another thing to do it. So, you know, I try to do that in my life. I mean, I, I've had people come to me and just in my face say very offensive things. Now, sometimes, <laughs> if I'm in right relationship with the Lord, I sit there and unforgiveness never enters my heart. No, no, I'm not going there because I love and enjoy my fellowship with the one who created all this, and I want to be right with him. I encourage you today, if you have unforgiveness toward anyone, to resolve it. Get it out of your heart before it does damage to you. Okay? Make sure that our fellowship with God transcends all the offenses of this world. Thanks for being a part of Bay West today. Bay West Church meets at 100 Emerson Road in Palm Bay at 11 a.m. on Sundays. Please feel free to check us out at baywestchurch.org or you can follow us on Facebook at Bay West Church.